So I do have an important disclosure, and that's that last year I was so enthused by Memorial Sloan Kettering's platform of more science, less fear, that I put 10 or so science slides in my presentation, and then I stepped down from the podium, and one of my colleagues, the next one up, ridiculed me for that. So this year I'm going back to my box of being a pimple pathologist professionally, and um, I'm, I'm gonna have a new platform, which is less science for peers and more pathology, more cheer, so I have no other disclosures. <laughs> <laughs> the case history that you had was a 30-year-old who presented a male, and that's important, with a one-year history of right hand and right fifth finger pain. And the pain was localized to the base of the right thumb, thanar region, and the tip of the palmar aspect of the right small finger. And over time, he noticed uh, masses at both locations. And he came in and had an excisional biopsy of uh, both the right thumb and palm mass, which looked uh, the same. And so the slide that you had to review if you had chosen to do so would show a tumor which is both dermal and also within the subcutis. It's not well encapsulated. It's uh, clearly dissecting through the subcutaneous fat. And the uh, medium power view over here shows an admixture of cells that are epithelioid and also vaguely spindled. And the higher power shows uh, an area which appears to be relatively histiocytoid looking. Um, not frankly malignant, but certainly there is nerve which is entrapped within the tumor here. And so based on, uh, on this architecture, however, it appears to be as a, an aggressive tumor. And um, the higher power view, which is taken from this region right here, shows that there is a small aggregate of neutrophils, which are also scattered throughout the tumor, which ends up being relatively classic in about a third of these tumor types. And so at this point in time, the case came in as a consult. It was called carcinoma on the hand of a, of a 30 year old, likely squamous cell carcinoma. And, uh, and I signed it out as malignant uh, spindle and epithelioid cell neoplasm. And uh, there was a small note below which essentially said that carcinoma would be rare in this demo, or squamous cell carcinoma would be rare in this demographic. And I advised submitting more slides for further characterization. And that's exactly what the hand surgeon did. And uh, we confirmed that it showed AE1, AE3 reactivity. It also showed strong ERG reactivity, and it stained uh, for FLY1 and NKIC3, and it had some important and relevant uh, negatives. It was negative for 31 and 34. It was also negative for the other keratin, CK5, 6, CAM, MNF116, and it showed retained expression of INI1 throughout. So, in fact, based on the immuno panel and the morphology, I, I signed it out, and then we had some confirmatory cytogenetics, which came in like a month later. And so I signed it out as pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma, and uh, that is the most common terminology for that today, but I think it's worth going back in time and reviewing where this came from and how we got to there, from there to here. And so this was first described or thought to be described in 1992 by Mira, at all in five cases of a fibroma-like variant of epithelioid sarcoma, which occurred on a single limb with multifocal disease and bone involvement, and they noted these bland keratin-positive spindled cells. And then a similar um, powered study came out in 2003 from Billings, who of course changed the name again. They had a similar type of presentation of seven tumors in young to middle-aged adults that were mostly epithelioid, focally spindled, showed very similar features, which they noted at the time to Mira's study, and they called it epithelioid sarcoma like hemangioendothelioma. And now here we are since 2011 calling it something else yet again to make life a little bit more exciting, but this time we have 50 cases of a similar tumor. Uh, which were thought to be in the study of endothelial origin, and there are a variety of reasons to consider them of endothelial origin. And the name was changed uh, to pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma. And I'm basically going to focus on the last study and run you through the demographics and distribution and the prognosis, and there's nothing more complicated in this year's talk. So you should have a good handle on this entity when you're finished. You'll look at it like 15 pictures of it, so hopefully a little bit of um, reinforcement in the next 12 minutes. So as was noted in the case that I started with, this has actually a very striking male predominance of about five to one with a median age of 31. And 82% of these patients are less than 40 years old at presentation. 50%, like our patient, had painful nodules. And the distribution, about 80% of them are on a distal extremity. The remainder being on trunk, head, and neck, and I think there's one or two visceral presentations of them. And at these locations, the majority of the tumors occur in the dermis and subcutis, but there are a notable percentage that occur uh, almost exclusively in skeletal muscle, and 
and still another notable percentage that occur in bone. And there are quite a few reports since this study in 2011 of bone uh, only disease. And so the multifocal presentation is about 66%. What that means is that there are, can be anywhere from two to 15 foci that are uh, noted at the time of presentation. And essentially this occurs in multiple tissue planes in 32 of 33 of the patients that had multifocal presentation in this study. And uh, what's helpful is that they are pet avid lesions in the majority of cases. And this is just a, a nice way to look at the, the overview of the fact that these tumors essentially all occur from the second to the fifth decade. And in each decade, they all have a very strong male predominance in these 50 cases. And then this was a 25-year-old who had a PET scan in the left lower extremity is showing multiple nodules lighting up. And what you'll look at next is rather striking, and that's the amputation of the same patient, which shows multiple tumor deposits uh, noted by the white arrows throughout the skeletal muscle of the leg in this patient. And so what ends up being really remarkable is that this is, although the presentation appears to be an aggressive one, it's actually quite an indolent disease, and we'll get to there near the end of the talk. But first, we're going to run through a variety of different published images of pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma, and this one is very similar to the case that I started with, which with a predominantly dermal tumor and extension into the subcutis by a fascicular spindle cell proliferation. It's very loosely fascicular. And then on the right, you can see uh, another case which is somewhat spindled and involving the bone. They all have this very striking eosinophilic cytoplasm throughout, and the atypia that you see is quite moderate. It's never a highly pleomorphic. This is showing an example in the subcutis, which has almost a plexiform growth pattern. And then on the right side, you can see that it almost has a, a, a rhabdoid or a skeletal muscle type look to it. There's perhaps a better way to, to describe it in this picture. But again, the nuclear atypia is not very striking. There's a nucleolus, but it's uh, not particularly chunky. And then the pseudomyogenic uh, terminology is perhaps best emphasized on the, the left, where you can see it, it's more fascicular in some cases, um, raising the possibility of, of smooth muscle differentiation. And then on the right, you can see this, this glassy, almost rhabdoid distribution of the, um, of the, the eosinophil, which looks uh, strikingly almost like skeletal muscle. And so we get back to the case that I presented, uh, where I noted that the neutrophils ended up being a very classic feature for this, and it's about 30% of cases that have a neutrophilic infiltrate seen throughout them. And a very small number of cases show vascular or neural involvement or necrosis. And now, again, we pointed out in my case that uh, there was a, quite a histiocytoid population in there, and this can be problematic, particularly if you have a small biopsy, which can raise uh, multiple avenues of potential differential diagnosis, including if you were to look at this low power with the scattered lymphocytes and the large eosinophilic cells, you could even think of something like Rosei Dorfman in here, or a primary histiocytic condition. But when you see the bulk of the tumor, it becomes more clear that in 95-plus um, percentage of cases, the epithelioid population is, in fact, the minority population. And in this series that was presented, really, there was only, this was the most atypical case that they could come up with cytologically. So the atypia is never really too astounding. So in review, they're all infiltrative. They all have plump spindle cells with bright eosinophilic cytoplasm with a minor epithelioid component. They're occasionally rhabdomyoblastic. Their mitoses in general are very low. Uh, the, the mean mitotic rate for high power field was two, the median of one. However, you can get an occasional outlier. And for those patients, pre people in the audience that might be derm pass, um, you can have an element of epidermal hyperplasia on top of it. And I think it's relevant diagnostically because as everyone knows, we get these tiny little crummy cups of something. So we get the hat of something and you never know if it's the hat of Mickey Mouse or it's the hat of Godzilla. And so <laughs> you have to be a little bit careful uh, as to what you're dealing with, uh, especially since 25% of them can have a really significant epidermal hyperplasia, which makes it actually difficult for the clinicians to get into the lesion. And um, you can get ulceration in about 30%. So they thought that it's purported to be of endothelial differentiation for a variety of purposes. First, the ERG reactivity that you're seeing throughout it, but also uh, even though there were no weeble pallad bodies on EM in the two cases, there were other softer features that supported endothelial differentiation, which are listed here. And now the IHC is, is quite interesting, in fact, for these tumors and quite reproducible. 100% of the tumors stain with AE1, AE3, 100% stain with FLY1, and they all show intact INI1 expression. 
And so the remainder of it you can study, about 50% have CD31 reactivity uh, in them, and a smattering of other markers which are generally weak. But that positivity for A1, A3, uh, FLY1, and retained INI1 is quite helpful. And the retained INI1, of course, was part of the, the, uh, the rationale that they used to split that off from epithelioid sarcoma, because as most people know, over 95% of them show loss of INI1 expression. And so this is a very classic example here. The top panel shows strong AE1, AE3. The top right, FLY1, 50% have CD31 reactivity, and they all show retention of INI1. So the differential is quite broad. It also depends somewhat on where you are for your biopsy, but much of it's quite easy. Squamous cell carcinoma has P40 and P63 expression and doesn't express these others. A cellular FH has no ERG, 31 or FLY1. Smooth muscle tumors will make Desmond and Caldesmond, and you don't see Desmond or Caldesmond in pseudomyogenic hemangioendotheliomas. And then epithelioid hemangioendothelioma expresses CD34, which you don't see in pseudomyogenics. It also grows in cords and strands. And of course, we know about the two fusion genes for which it's quite helpful if you have them. If you don't, you may even have the IHC for PAM, uh, which can be helpful. And then angiosarcoma expresses CD34, again, not seen in pseudomyogenics, and they're generally vasoformative. So the real um, rationale for splitting off pseudomyogenics from epithelioid sarcoma was first the INI1 expression. Of course, there are also some subtle differences in, um, in, in the presentation. Epithelioid sarcoma uh, generally will present on a distal extremity, but then it will march up that extremity and doesn't present as multiple masses across multiple um, tissue planes. And also, uh, epithelial sarcoma, incidentally, is significantly more aggressive as if taken as a whole category. About, there's about 40% um, risk of uh, lymph node involvement, which is much less in pseudomyogenic hemangioendotheliomas. And then to make it even more straightforward for you, there are the cytogenetics have been worked out for pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma, and there's a translocation 719, which fuses these two proteins, for which there is now an emerging body of literature suggesting, I think, that FOSB might be helpful via IHC in the distinction, although there have not been a lot of tumors which have been screened for FOSB, and it appears as if there's also uh, quite a bit of reactivity in other uh, normal tissues, so you have to be aware as to how that plays out. And so the prognosis, as I said, it's more of an intermediate uh, grade tumor. In the 31 cases that had follow-up, 58% had local recurrence within one to two years, with four patients undergoing amputations and only one patient with regional node involvement. In the original, this original series, large series, only one patient had uh, distant metastasis or death, and that was from a foot primary that recurred 16 years later with widely distributed metastatic disease. And so the status at follow-up for the, the largest series was that of those 31 patients that they had follow-up, 27 had no evidence of disease, two patients had persistent disease, one unknown, and the patient that I mentioned uh, was deceased. And so my final thoughts, if you could learn just one thing, was that pseudomyogenic hemangioendothelioma occurs multifocally in the extremities of young men with an indolent clinical course and a small risk of metastasis. That's all I have for you.